the mantle. Last mini lecture, we talked about how to get our hands on the mantle, how we can sample mantle xenoliths, look at ophiolites, which is these tectonically exposed section and conversion boundaries, and then also go to slow spreading ridges that don't produce much mid-ocean ridge lava and sample abyssal peridotites. Now, today's lecture, this is going to be Roman numeral 5, and we're going to get into geochemistry at a level we've really not done this semester. And the heading is going to be chemistry to understand the mantle. This topic is a huge one for understanding the mantle because we can't really go there. It's hard for us to get samples, but basalts are produced by melting. And if we can look at the liquid that's produced from the mantle, we can use that liquid to then understand the mantle. That's the idea, really. So we're going to study basalts that are produced by mantle melting. And if we look at the chemistry of those basalts, we can understand something about the mantle that's left behind. Basalts that are produced by mantle melting. And this is gone into depth quite well in the textbook. And so if I lose you at any one of these points, I do recommend you go read about geochemistry of the mantle and in basalts in the textbook. So the main type of elements that we're going to use to understand the Earth's mantle is trace elements. These are ones that occur at less than one weight percent. We don't use the major elements because those aren't sensitive enough to understand all these processes. But we're going to use trace element compositions to provide information. Let's go this. Trace element compositions of basalt to infer their mantle source. And I want to remind you of two words. Uh, we have fertile, we have infertile. Those are the two biggest types of domains within the mantle. And then there's another one that can be enriched. Remember, fertile means that it has never melted previously. It's pristine. In this class right now, we're going to use lurzolite as the name of the peridotite that's never been melted before. And infertile means it has been depleted previously. Here, we're just going to call this uh, maybe peridotite or even dunite. That might be a better specific type of peridotite that is um, infertile. And then the next thing I need to introduce you to is this idea of partition coefficients. And so I'm going to say here, recall partition coefficients. Assuming that you've learned about them in chemistry or mineralogy, but maybe you haven't, so we'll, or maybe it's hard for you to remember. I'll just put a couple bits of information here. One, we tend to use the symbol of KD as the partition coefficient. And what they describe is the minerals affinity for elements. So this is a minerals affinity for elements. Right? How bad does it want to keep the elements? There can be elements that are compatible and others that are incompatible. So we could have an affinity that is compatible, and these have values greater than 1. And then you can have things that are incompatible, and they want to get rid of those constituents, or they can't even accommodate them in their uh, crystal lattice. So maybe a KD, a partition coefficient of 10, would be something that's compatible, and a KD of 10 to the minus 3 would be something that would be incompatible. Okay, we want to get rid of it. And as we think about compatible and incompatible elements and partition coefficients, we want to do this for peridotites. So we need to think about what elements want to be in olivine, in clinopyroxene, in orthopyroxene, and in that aluminum bearing phase, which could be spinel or plagioclase or garnet. Well, let's try a drawing to introduce this idea even maybe a little bit better. We're going to do this with major elements just because it's easy. Here is Al2O3 and here is TiO2. Let's say we start with a rock 
of lurzolite that has this composition. And then we melt that lurzolite. We melt that lurzolite and we're going to produce a melt that is enriched. All right, if we go to higher values, that it means they're enriched. And so here would be enriched. Enriched, you can spell that better than me. Uh -huh. And then if you go to lower values of Al2 or 3 or titanium, that means you're starting to get depleted. Now what ends up happening is that melts become enriched. Melts are enriched and residual material, the residuum, we'll call this one dunite, residuum is depleted. So we're going to lose titanium and lose aluminum from the rock. It goes all into the basaltic melt which means the leftover rock, the dunite, is very poor in aluminum and very poor in titanium. This is the way I want you to be thinking about trace elements as well. So we can think about fertility and infertility and enrichment and depletion with these graphs that look like this. And they have a very long x-axis that has rare earth elements, which range from lutetium, sorry, lanthanum to lutetium and these are things like um, well I'll just go ahead and put them in here cerium, neodymium, samarium, europium, gadolinium, dysprosium, uh oh ER I don't remember off the top of my head right now and then YB ytterbium and we call these rare earth elements, rare earth elements. And then on the y-axis, we do this thing which has division. And what we do is we take the composition of the rock that we care about and we divide it by like the pristine mantle. And so if we were to plot, here's one, this is log scale, here's 10, here's 100. So if we were to take our rock, which is pristine mantle, and we divide it by pristine mantle, we should get a composition that is equal to one across the entire um, suite of rare earth elements because you're taking itself and dividing it by itself. So we can say like fertile mantle plots at one. Now that is not gonna be true though for depleted mantle that has lost rare earth elements and enriched melt that gains rare earth elements. So we're gonna plot a couple of these things. Let's go red for magma. What ends up happening is that we get this enrichment profile. I'm going to try to do this here in red. If we were to melt 10% of fertile mantle, we would produce a plot, a composition of a basalt that plots along this. And if we were to plot the line for a 1% melt, it even plots higher. And the residual depleted mantle that would result from this kind of melting would be something like this. Kind of symmetrical to these. So this would be like a, a depleted mantle. Because we have lost rare earth elements and added them to the liquid. All right, so we're going to say these are melts. Oops, spelled that wrong. Melt. And so let's see, we're going to put this, put this right here and put a couple notes. The slope of the line, we'll put three. The slope of the line is a measure of partial melting. Slope of line is measure of enrichment or depletion which typically acts as a, a proxy for the degree of partial melt. So let's put that proxy of percent partial melt. The shallow lines that don't deviate from one very much are like this because they've been diluted so much. This actually takes something to think about. So let's, let's write it down and then think about it. So shallow means 
much dilution from high melting, high percent melt, right? Because, okay, so let's say you have a rock. It's a Lurzlite. You melt 100% of it. Well, then it has to fall along this line. So a 100% melt would fall along the 100% rock line. A 50% melt, well, it'd be pretty similar to it. And so it ends up being that as you get to lower and lower degrees partial melting, you're diff more and more different from the starting place. That's why the smaller degrees partial melt are really far away from the line. So we're going to say here that steep lines, okay, steep lines on these graphs, they are low percent melts. And we're going to say that only the incompatible elements are released, released to melt. These type of elements here, these are called our light, rare earth elements. These are the most incompatible patible in mantle minerals. These are called the heavy rare earth elements. And these are the most compatible in mantle minerals. Okay? So we're going to have a low percent partial melt. It's going to release the incompatible elements to the melt, producing lines that are very steep. Let's do a couple more examples before I kick you out to the, uh, to the textbook to really emphasize this idea. And what we'll do here, let's scroll down, let's go here. And we're going to go trace element patterns, pattern for mid-ocean ridge basalt. We could look at the trace element pattern in a mid-ocean ridge basalt going from lanthanum to lutetium to understand what degree of partial melting occurred and what kind of source it melted from. All right, so the trace element pattern for MORB is going to tell us about the percent melt and then what source. If we can answer those questions, well, we've just done a very powerful thing. So let me show you what the trace element pattern for a MORB looks like. So let's see, here we're going to have our rock, which is a morb. We're going to divide it by primitive mantle, pristine primitive mantle. We're going to have a 1 to 1 line here. Here is our 10 to 1. Here is our 100 to 1. What ends up happening is that the enrichment goes from about 1 up to maybe 5 as you go across. It's a downward curving line. They tend to, the, depending on where in the world you look at MORB, they're almost always all flat like this. They're almost always smooth like this. They almost always have this kind of uh, small, light, rare earth element depletion. This is curious. One thing we can see is that we do not get very steep lines. And from the rule of thumb, that means that we must be having a big partial melt. Because steep lines are from really small percent partial melts. So we know that it has to be a big partial melt. And then the other thing we're learning about morbs here is that they are from melting of an infertile source that's already been depleted. And we're going to put that down here and I'll show you. Melting from an infertile mantle source. And in fact, if we were to plot where the mantle source would be that created this mid-ocean ridge pattern, it would be something like here. Where the source, so this is like the potential source, the mantle source has already lost lost the light rare earths and so with partial melting occurring to that area a second time it doesn't have these 
to contribute. So we're going to say doesn't have light rare earths. Or you could say already lost light rare earths from an earlier melting event. Doesn't have light rare earths to contribute. That's the only way to make that pattern. And this is now agreed upon. This was big science in like the 1950s, 1970s. This was really exciting stuff. A couple of years after that, right around the same time, well, people started to say, okay, then what do we learn about trace elements from other basalt sources? So let me show you one right here. Um, this is a type called ocean island basalts. These are places like Hawaii or the Galapagos. We know these are from mantle plume regions. And if we look at the trace element plot, that is, well, just make yours straight. Okay, I'm not going to erase because time is precious. If we go from lanthanum to lutetium, I should erase, shouldn't I? Time's not precious to, to allow us to have that crappy of a line. All right, let's get that line straighter. Better. So lanthanum to lutetium. We get a kind of jaggedy plot that is very enriched. So upwards of like a hundred, some, oops, 10, one. So what we see here is that these are very enriched in light rare earths, very enriched in light rare earths. This is coming from, we can conclude that this is coming from low percent partial melting because it has such a steep light rare earth enrichment and the source here is fertile. This is coming from a fertile mantle source and we think that these are coming from deeper domains in the mantle. If we were to put what the mantle source looks like well, it should be right about here at 1 because it is a pristine primitive mantle. So if we put this all together and have capital F as our final visual, what's going on here? Final visual. Then what I will do, we're going to draw like a, an oceanic seafloor setting. And it there's going to be a place where mantle is being melted to produce melt at the mid-ocean ridge system. And importantly, this is coming from shallow mantle and it's already depleted. But ocean island basalts, they're probably being generated from mantle melting deeper as they're coming up to feed volcanoes like Hawaii. And so they are from deep in the mantle that are remaining pristine and let's just use the word fertile. All right, that's it for the mantle. If you have questions, take a look at that textbook. And if not, answered there, Wikipedia, and then email me. Thanks, bye.